Uh, hey, I'm Sam, and I love my coffee um, with a bunch of Splenda and black as night. Sam Partry. Sam Party. Oh, I didn't even realize his name is like Party. Party.io. Yeah, that's his website. Yeah. Dude, this guy was a party. Let's be honest. This was fun. <laughs> I had a great time talking to him. You had some takeaways. Uh, we had some good laughs. What were your takeaways? And then I'll talk about some laughs. Yeah, Sam, really awesome guy. Super, super nerdy, super cool. I mean, really just great to chat with him. He has a really extensive background in high-performance computing and just all mm -hmm. the latest, greatest scalable training inference, all these things, which I think makes him a very good fit for Redis and the stuff that they're doing. I mean, he's really leading a lot of their, their efforts, pushing forward the Redis platform to be more than just the web serving cache that we've known it as up to now. And one of my main takeaways was that it seems like a very natural progression for the platform, actually. I, I, mm. I see how they're evolving to be this AI focused, AI native serving platform that does vector similarity, that does feature, store, provides those kinds of functionalities. Yeah. Uh, I think he's doing a good job of evangelizing and, and expanding those functionalities and making that a natural evolution for the platform as a whole. Yeah, I loved how he talked about when you asked him, what or how did you decide to go in this direction? And it's like, well, the community was asking for it or they were already doing it without yeah. us even thinking about it. And then we realized, oh yeah, maybe there's some overlap that we can go into. And they started exploring it and then they got into it that way. And Redis for me is like an incredible open source project. I love what they're doing. This episode is sponsored by Redis. We go, we do a bit of a deep dive on what Redis is up to in the beginning of the episode. So if you are interested in Redis, you're going to love it. If you're not interested, skip to like halfway and you can just hear about Sam Party's background and all this distributed computer stuff and or distributed computing <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and then... Yeah, we had some laughs. I mean, it was it was a great time with Sam. I really enjoyed it. I love the rebrand that they're doing or like just kind of bringing this to the ML community. I think a lot of people out there also are used to using Redis and so it's not that big of a change and they're enjoying this happening too. Mm -hmm. So that's it, man. Uh, updates on our side from the community side as... I mentioned a few episodes ago, and I've, I'm going to keep mentioning it. We're starting to do more in-person events. Mikael is doing stuff in San Francisco. If anyone is in San Francisco and you want to meet and Come have through. some coffee or, or beers or whatever uh, he's organizing, you can talk with him about that. And yeah. we've also got a lot of other places. And this is, I'm so stoked, dude. I don't know if you know how many places we've got. Like right now, there's people in Melbourne, Australia and Sydney, Australia, people oh. in Tel Aviv, people in Mexico City, Argentina, uh, Toronto, Canada, Montreal, and then <laughs> Europe, all over the place in Europe. So I'm just using this as an excuse to go and travel and meet people in the MLOps community in person. Hopefully this Melbourne and Australia thing comes through because I've never been to Oz and I would love to go and you should come with me. <laughs> I think it's closer. <laughs> to you than it is to me uh, yeah I, it might be is it i it, yeah I, I can never tell because it goes like around the globe west yeah, you go the other way west. Yeah, yeah right okay <laughs> yeah yeah no we're worldwide worldwide yeah. also i saw the pictures from was it berlin you guys yeah. had quite a showing i mean Dude, it made it sf awesome. look like like a village, honestly. <laughs> yeah, and SF's <that's> supposed <laughs> to be the... the I know. Place, I, was, I was like, man. what? We can't oh let Berlin beat us. <laughs> Berlin's just cool, dude. Berlin is very cool. So if you're Berlin in Berlin... Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean... Or if you want to organize something in your city, get a hold of us. If you, There's probably something that's happening in your city, to be honest. We're all over the place. We're making stuff happen. So let's do it. Let's do it. It's just so much fun to actually meet in person again after being inside for two years. And now I forgot what it was like to have to hold eye contact with people. And like, <laughs> it's scary. It's a very scary thing. 
I lost a lot of social skills and uh, <laughs> I'm relearning them as we go. So anyway, this is a long intro. Let's get into the talk. People are like, come on. I, I just want to hear about Redis, guys. Can you stop talking about this? How much, how bad you are as social these days. <laughs> so we're going to get into it right now. Let's go. This is a great place to start, which is how we just led into the conversation. And that is Redis is doing a lot more than it says on the tin. What's going on, Sam? Like, when did this start? And tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it's a great question. I think the what we've been doing lately is really growing awareness to the fact that there's more to do these days with Redis than the traditional caching that you probably know Redis for. Um, what Redis has been traditionally used for is speeding up websites, speeding up retrieval from your durable database. People put it in front of their durable database, they get faster retrieval times because 20% of that data is cached, and so you get that data a lot faster. Um, but these days it's growing. So that's kind of the first layer of, you know, this German chocolate cake, if you will. The first layer is that open source community, you know, it is that really strong backbone where we have grown a use case for caching. It's been used in, you know, open source enterprise, et cetera, um, as that caching layer. And now the second layer that we're layering on top it's really the module ecosystem. So if you think of Redis JSON, which turns it into a document database, Redis search, which turns it into you know, full text search capabilities, and now with the addition of vector search, um, that's really the second layer. It's a composable database. You're able to put modules in that change the functionality of Redis, and that's a really interesting part of it. And then the third kind of layer that um, is also really interesting is the fact that it's positioned differently now. So you see these platforms like Feast and like Tecton and Feature Form that are using it as an online feature store. And you know, that's it's really interesting. It's changing the positioning of Redis and where it's being used. Um, and it's really because of what uh, what I like to say is what's on paper. It's still the same cache database. You're still getting the same retrieval times. It's just being used in a different use case because of that layer two that I was talking about, the ability to customize the capability and the API within the database. And we found that people really like that to the point where we ended up releasing Redis Stack, which is essentially just the most popular modules that we have bundled into one container with you know, your base open source Redis. And people really like that experience because you can use it for all types of things. And it's one click to deploy I mean, we're getting absolutely you know, crushed with downloads on Docker, millions of downloads, mm -hmm. mostly because it's just easy to get an app started with this kind of database. You can really tune it and do any kind of activity you want with it. So there's been some really strong feedback from developers on that. I think that's super impressive. It, to be perfectly honest, I, I've, my background in Redis is also more in the pure backend backend standpoint, right, where using it exactly as you described as web apps speeding up, uh, just really as a cache layer. It, so when I heard about Redis AI, like Redis Labs, this, this new AI-focused initiative, I was a little bit confused, to be perfectly honest. I, it didn't make immediate sense to me. What is the vision here for, for you know, you mentioned all these, these new initiatives, Redis JSON, the time series, the, the kind of feature stores, all, all these, the search capability, vector, vector search, et cetera. What is the vision here? Like, what is the team? What is the team's charter? Right? Why is this like a natural next step yeah. in evolution? If you consider an evolution, or maybe you consider it like a, just an orthogonal or maybe auxiliary, you know, parallel branch, or is this like the next step for Redis as a, as a as a platform entirely? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. So, it's really about that German chocolate cake. Going back to that analogy, you know, layering on capability. I love capability. that analogy. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, it's giving people more opportunities to use it in different ways. So this is just another way that we think, you know, it can be used. And this is really just because we've done research in how are people using it. If you're looking at people like DoorDash um, with their uh, real-time system doing route optimization or recommendations, or you're looking at Uber with Michelangelo and what they've done, um, a lot of these kind of 
you know, BYOR, bring your own Redis implementations, mm -hmm. they are using it for a feature store. And so that's when we noticed that's, that's where the vision kind of started is there's all of these companies, these you know, large, massive enterprises that were asking us, hey, can we use Redis Enterprise for this? Or can we do this with Redis? And they needed expertise in saying, how can we get this done? Um, and going back to because of what's on paper is just really, you know, single digit millisecond latencies that allow you to retrieve features faster than other data stores. And so when we noticed this and we saw this in the ecosystem with places like I mentioned, AT&T or Comcast or, you know, these big behemoth companies looking for ways to, you know, optimize their machine learning pipelines, we said, we should probably build more features around us. <laughs> we should probably, um, you know, explore this market some more. And I think that's really where a lot of that initiative started is just supporting those people, just like we always have in the open source, you know, really supporting the people that are using the database. And we wanted to grow into supporting those AI and ML uh, developers that we saw, you know, using it for those use cases. Um, and especially those companies as well, because there's obviously a market there. Is it easy to change the narrative? No. Around going no. from okay, that's yeah, what we're doing right now. That's what we're doing. Yeah, that's why we, we're yeah. on a podcast. Yeah. That's why it's named uh, <laughs> okay. what it is. Yeah. Oh, is that what this is? Is, yeah. it, is are we are we uh, just helping the cause? Yeah, okay. you're, you're you're soldiers in the fight right now. This is this is what it is. Thanks. <laughs> Missionaries of the cause. Got it. Uh, well, yeah. What does that shift look like? I mean, uh, jokes aside, or I mean, sure. maybe maybe this isn't a joke. Maybe this is reality aside. Uh, what is how does that narrative change? I mean, going from from the 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 cash for all all, all servers and, and web web endpoints and whatnot to now this new and improved AI uh, you know low latency uh, serving platform. It, it is a really great question, and it's not easy. It is something that um, you know. It's easy for when you talk to the DoorDashes or the Ubers because they already have an engineering yeah. team that's yeah, 40 resources. people deep. That, yeah. yeah, exactly. But not everybody has that. And so um, one thing that I've been focusing on um, since I came aboard was making really easy to understand applications with it. So um, one, one example is this, this vector search application. It's a new thing for Redis. It's basically the ability to take any kind of unstructured data use a transformer or whatnot, you know, some type of deep learning model, create an embedding, store that within Redis, and then do, you know, uh, even hierarchical, small navigatable worlds or something like that. I think it's HNSW. HNSW. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, indexing methods and also selection. And then, of course, search methods to be able to say, find me the most similar embedding to this image embedding or this text embedding. And people immediately see with this demo, um, which I, you can check out on GitHub, I open sourced it. Um, you can see immediately uh, what it does is find me images that look like this t-shirt, find me a text that resembles this text. And those demos, what they do is they bring that value to something that even a consumer that's not technical can understand. Um, and so being able to go through on your phone and say, you know, view similar by image, or you know, view similar by text, that really brings it to life and you start going, oh. And then when you make a full stack application like that, you know, everything from React TypeScript front end all the way back down to fast API back end, run as a single page application in a single Docker container, people, the engineers that see it start to recognize the value of the fact that you can bring a service like this up with two Docker containers on an EC2 instance that has four vCPUs. And I'm running that right now. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it survived an entire Databricks conference um, on that tiny little EC2 <laughs> server. And we had like 180 users on it at one point, which isn't a whole lot and it's not a huge data set. But the point there being is it's something that you can really easily and quickly create value from and showing those really easy to deploy, easy to create applications with that like consumer facing realization value is the best way to bring that value to light and kind of change that narrative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I do think that's really powerful. The, and I saw some of the stuff that you open source, and I think that's a really great way to evangelize new use cases for technology. One thing, though, that, that I am fascinated by, and I've always found a little bit tricky, maybe, in the, in the case of 
tools that are more like core pieces of infrastructure that are being used to demonstrate some functionality. And so here's what I mean. When you talk about Redis, like this is this is like a this is like an underlying primitive, like a core thing that enables something else, right? This isn't, and when you build a, even an application focused uh, like demo around Redis as a core building block, that's not the same thing as saying, hey, I'm using TensorFlow and I'm building a model. You know what I mean? It's, it's there's like a much, the, 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 tr the translation from the tool and what it enables is much easier going from TensorFlow to MNIST model versus Redis as a database to, hey, we enabled something that you couldn't do before, right? So it feels yeah. like there are just more hops in, in a consumer's mind they have to make to understand, oh, this is possible because of Redis, not because right. of all this like other stuff that, that, you know, like Redis is just like one line maybe in an import statement somewhere and like one oh, call yeah. somewhere in, you know what I mean? So how do, you, how do you make that value prop more clear when you do these kinds of demos? Yeah, and that's exactly... Um, exactly what I've been toying with and thinking about is really, you know, when we go to these conferences, when we talk to developers and we say things like, um, you know, this will enable you to do real-time machine learning. This will have the sub-second latencies that enable, you know, as you're typing in a search bar for machine learning recommendations to appear. And to engineers that understand how hard and complex doing activities like that or making APIs like that are, makes a lot of sense. But to someone who, you know, maybe has the purchasing power, a PM who isn't maybe as technical, there is a layer that actually is really hard to understand sometimes that, you know, it, is it, it isn't the TypeScript React front end. You know, you're not seeing the spinny wheels and the button clicks, you know, yeah. it's, it's about the speed of retrieval, which isn't something that you necessarily see. You're not pulling up a flame graph in Chrome and saying, see how much shorter this is than you know X database? Because that's not something that is gonna bring a PM to the table. That is not something that is going to say, hey guys, you know, look how much cooler or look how much faster this database is than another. What it's gonna do is it's gonna say, I have some really deep technical expertise in this area and kind of ostracize your solution from others because it has this one small difference. So when you make these applications, it's, it's about focusing on the pieces that wouldn't ordinarily be there if that application or that database wasn't present. So when we say things like online feature store and try to teach the difference between offline and online, talking about millisecond retrievals, but putting them in the context of an application that someone can see. You know, when you, you know, talking about that uh, vector search demo, when you say by image and 15 images appear almost instantaneously, and you say, click it a hundred more times, and the retrieval speed will always be the same. And then you show them an application that is pulling directly from Postgres, and it's trying to do the same thing. And then they click it a hundred times, and it, it appears twice. Or, you know, it has serious latency issues. That is like how you can make those discrepancies really apparent to people. But once again, that requires a lot of engineering effort just to put those demos together. Yeah. So. I'm still thinking of better ways to even show that value. Um, so, you know, it's something we're absolutely working on. Well, Redis is also, in my eyes at least, and I think in the eyes of many, the quintessential like bottoms up motion. And maybe you're trying to change that too, but I feel like it's very easy to go and get your hands dirty with Redis and, and figure out like, is this right for my use case? Just because of the way that uh, it's been positioned for ages and the way that it started as this very organic open source project. Uh, and then like what you're talking about there is so true when it comes to the engineers. Engineers are going to understand the value of this, but then as you start going higher up, it's lost in translation a little bit more. And so I, I can see how like you almost have to empower the engineers to be able to make the case for to their manager or whoever it is that is is you buy, has that buying power uh so exactly yeah and and this is a i think this is kind of a problem with a lot of the ml ops tools like to be honest it's not just redis right like i've seen it yeah. with a few different tools it's very easy for engineers to understand the value of it but then or a data scientist even 
but then going up the food chain, it's much harder for them to like explain, like translate from geek and just nerd out on it to like business value. And so how do you do that? And that's kind of the role I feel like of the ML ops or the ML tooling company, they have to have that firepower and that like uh, propaganda or promo or paraphernalia to be able to give to and empower the <laughs> engineers. And so, but just like kind of diving a little bit deeper into the, um, like, I really want to talk more about this vector database and what is going Absolutely. on there. I know there's a lot of people that are pretty stoked about it, especially when I was mentioning it back in the day before, I think any official news came out because I heard beforehand, because I got, I got to connect at Redis. You got the inside scoop. <laughs> yeah, I'm just so cool like that. <laughs> the uh, We were joking before about Sam and how he had to call his property manager uh, and tell him that he was on a podcast and a podcast that is very popular for five people in the world. <laughs> oh yeah. Anyway, my, of my Redis connect won. told me. <laughs> Sam is mother too. Of the, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> The Don't, forget Don't forget my brothers. Don't forget my brothers. So, so the, the vector database, like just give us a background scoop on that because uh, yeah. shout out to Jose Navarro who was very stoked on this when I told him about it. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, like what's going on there? What is it uh, for the people who haven't heard about it or know what you're trying to do there? Yeah, absolutely. So first, uh, great question. Um, so the there's a lot of things out there, a lot of, of products out there that are pitching themselves as a vector database solution. So if you're not familiar with vector databases, essentially it's the ability to store embeddings, embeddings being, um, you know, essentially vectors, lists of numbers created by machine learning models or deep learning models um, that you can use to do similarity comparisons or distance metrics to say how similar is one vector to another. The vector databases allow you to do this intelligently through indexing and storage capabilities that um, haven't necessarily been uh, the focus of databases before. Um, so one way that Redis is adapting to this is through its Redis search module. Um, and it's kind of a natural place for it since it is just a search module. What it enables you to do is index the keys. It's a key value store. So index the keys within Redis to be able to search over them intelligently. And prior to the vector database side, it was tag-based, um, text-based, full-text search, um, and a couple other, you know, geographic search. There's a lot of different ways that you can use Redis search, um, but this just adds one more powerful layer, which essentially turns Redis into a vector database. You can store embeddings inside of Redis, have them indexed and searched over, um, and then what that enables you to do is have that vector search capability um, stored within Redis, used inside of your application. And the best part is that it really usually doesn't change your stack. When we talk to uh, companies about this, when we talk to users about this, they're like, oh, we're already using that as a cache. You're saying all we have to do is store these tiny vectors inside of our cache, and then suddenly we get all this cool capability. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly how it works. And they're so excited about it <laughs> because it is such an easy improvement to their sites. Um, we were talking to this one company with it's like a 250 or something thousand uh, products. They're, uh, I think it's toys. Um, and what they wanted to do was have pages where people said, oh, I have bought or I've you know viewed these products, show me similar products. Um, but they wanted some more novelty in the way that they were doing it. They were doing a very classical kind of data centric way beforehand, um, doing some clustering and you know analysis like that. Um, but what vector search allows you to do is do, you know, even weighted vector search to the point where you can say, give me the ability to buy the text attributes of this particular item or these particular items and the image attributes of this particular item and or set of items. Show me a new set of items that resemble this item or set of items. And that is really powerful when you see it working in, in, in real time you start to realize how much better these search engines become, these recommendations become, because they actually are things you're interested in or things that are really similar to that product. 
Um, and that's been one of my favorite things about working at Redis actually is that um, this, this new push towards the vector database solution side, because it's one of my favorite uses of machine learning and deep learning uh, models, because it's really easy with things like the sentence transformers from Hugging Face, you can say model.encode. I mean, I'm sure you remember the days where you had to come up with a hook inside of your model so that, you know, as it was training or going through the forward pass, it copied out the buffer and then you could store that buffer in another place. And like now it's just, it's so much easier. You just say, you know, pull down this sentence transformer in code, boom, I have an embedding. And it was, it was not possible three or four years ago to say, you know, have a PyTorch model and do the same thing. And so that's one area that I'm really excited about because pretty much any piece of unstructured data, text, audio, video, images, what have you, you can just feed to these models and then create embeddings and perform really powerful intelligent searches over them and all in, you know, sub, you know, tens of seconds of millisecond latencies, which if you're talking about inference pipelines, if you're getting to one second in an inference pipeline, it's pretty good. Like that's, that's good enough for most use yeah. cases sub 100 milliseconds you're killing it you know you're doing really well and into the tens i mean that's really fast and so that's what i really like about this vector database solution from redis yeah at sub 10 you're like where do i sign on the dotted line and <laughs> yeah. give you all my money right uh, where do i give you my money <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly where do i give you money who am i sending this check to what about i mean <laughs> I, we've had uh, this guy, David, I think it's David Berg from Pinecone on here yep. before. And I know a ton of people out there are probably thinking, especially people who know about this space, they're probably wondering, like, what's the difference? Do you, have sure. you looked at, like, how you do things? Is it a fundamental difference or is it features and benefits that might be different? How do you look at that? Features with benefits. <laughs> yeah. um, so, <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so I've looked into uh, Pinecone, we V8. Uh, obviously, we've, we've looked at the market and seen a lot of the different competitors that are out there. Um, and kind of the way that I'll structure it is if you think about it like, um, you know, if you're thinking about, uh, just think of Cartesian grid and, you know, you have four, four quadrants, right? And it's like, open source versus managed. And then you have like, you know, the discrepancies between those two. Um, and really the difference between Redis and a lot of those other solutions is that Redis really has this great platform that's already being utilized for a lot of different things outside of being a vector database solution. And so just adding in the vector database solution just gives you the ability to say, oh, it's already in my stack. I'm not adding a dependency. I'm not adding a new piece. I'm not paying for a new service. I'm using my existing commit to AWS or I'm using my existing commit to Redis or wherever. Um, and it's not like some new PO that you have to draw up for your company. It's just already there and you can just keep using more of it. Um, and so that that's one really quick advantage that I see just on the, the business side of things is actually enabling this, um, which I don't think people actually talk about enough in the MLA space is like, you know, sometimes it's really hard to get a PO drawn up for your product and actually get yeah. it somewhere. And just having to already be in the pipeline is such a huge advantage because the second you're at feature parity, they're going to go with what they already have, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, trust me, AWS has been doing this recipe for That's, years. Mikhail knows better than anybody. <laughs> He's ex AWS. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to so, say yeah. that, like... How many people, there's there's a play, right? And it's a great play to get on the Amazon marketplace because of that. Like now people can allocate their Amazon budget towards a company that is in the marketplace and it's basically like their AWS spend, but they get this new tooling provider. Exactly. And that's what we've seen. Um, and so uh, what I was talking about at... Uh, What's that conference? Databricks conference. Um, I, I, I tweeted out an alternate title to my talk, which is, do you really need another vector database? Um, which, you know, it's, there are a lot of great tools and there are definitely points where there are features that exist in other products that are better um, or, you know, different in some way that, you know, maybe aren't reflected in the Redis vector database solution. 
Um, but what I can tell you is also, this is a primary point of focus and that we have enough demand for this that it, it's gonna be a fully featured platform in a matter of months. Um, and it's, it's gonna be, the best part about all of it is, is that it already is backed by all of the things that you get from enterprise. So like the geo distribution, the ability to use flash for embedding tables, like, you know, godly big, you can just put it on flash and pay a fraction of the cost. If you can you know, stand a little bit slower latency and not even by much, because NVMe's got really fast all of a sudden, then you know you can store two terabytes on NVMe as long as you pick the right uh, AWS instance. So that's that's something that you know we feel like because we already have a lot of those features, adding in the the vector database side of things, in addition to that you know business side of things that we already talked about, we feel like we're pretty competitive in the space. It, it sounds like what you're describing is is like the upsell model, right? Of of features being sold on platforms. And I think that's not because of my, my past biases at all. I think that is a very <laughs> powerful model, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, he's so seen I, it work I, really well. And so it's, it's, yeah. it's tried and true model. It's a tried and true model. Uh, so I, I hear where you're coming from. People will, people will take a little bit worse just for convenience, right? I mean, that this is, this is just human psychology in some sense. Uh, yeah. and, and bureaucratic convenience, I think, a lot of the times, too. And also so. to get on the ground floor of it, you know, being able to say, hey, can you guys implement this set of features mm -hmm. in this kind of way? Because the way they did it, didn't we didn't like. And we've seen that, too. They're like, oh, well, we don't really like the way this operates. It's not doing this in parallel. Can you guys do it in a background thread or in parallel? Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's almost like the Steve Jobs model where, you know, the Zoom came out first. And then he waited and saw how bad the Zoom was. And then he came back later and did the iPad and everybody loved it. Or, you know, excuse me, iPod. Um, sorry, I'm living in 2022. Um, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean, right? So, you know, and the Zoom never caught on. And not to say that this is the exact same comparison at all, but, you know, it gives you a mental model of being able to say, see something go to market, be an incumbent in a different area and say, hey, I think we can tackle that area too. So let's change gears uh, a little bit. And you've done some stuff in the past, which is pretty damn cool. Uh, I've been <laughs> looking at it a little bit. And you, I mean, you, you played around with distributed training, or I shouldn't say you yep. played around with. You went deep on distributed training, yeah. hyperparameter optimization, and scalable inference. And now you're at Redis. And I almost feel like, like is the need for speed in your blood What's going on there? Like, what, <laughs> what thirst are you trying to quench? I mean, at the end of the day, like, I am, I am a nerd. Like, I grew up building anything, or mostly taken apart, honestly, and my mom hated me for that. Taking apart pretty much everything and not always putting it back together. Um, I was fascinated uh, with supercomputers. I, my first internship was at Cray. Um, it's, uh, old, you know, since the sixties, one of the Cray one supercomputers or, um, and I fell in love with like how that evolution to Cray research from Seymour Cray and everything came to fruition at Cray Inc under Pete and Garo. And I really loved the way that you could just talk to people about, yeah, it's like 80,000 MacBook pros without a display strung together and people just, people's eyes would go, and you're like, yeah, isn't that cool? Um, and I, I, I fell in love with how you could use that for different problems. Um, it started working on chapels, the parallel programming language, um, and then things like Arcuda, which is a distributed version of NumPy, uh, which actually is backed by chapel. Um, and then, you know, that dovetailed into basically distributed feature selection, distributed uh, hyperparameter optimization. Um, and that's just really because AI started to say, hey, we should paralyze most of what we're doing. And all of a sudden I was working on AI just because I was in high performance computing. And this nerd love of extreme compute power suddenly became a valuable skill. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I, I keep, went on to work on distributed training, um, went into some really deep research around improving numerical simulations with AI, um, eventually made a framework around that called SmartSim. 
Um, and really, that's that's actually where I got exposed to Redis. But the the need for speed that you're talking about, that's where I that's where I fell in love with it. Is you know, there's not many people that want to sit down and try to optimize collective communications in MPI and get mm-hmm. you know joy out of improving <laughs> it by five percent and being like, yeah, I I did that. Like, look how much faster it is. Um, but I do, and that's the type of uh, that's the type of nerd I am. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm proud to say that. <laughs> In a sense, it's interesting that you say that a lot of people aren't interested in that. But even when you look at something like GPT-3, right, or any of these fancy Dolly 2-esque, uh, Dolly 3, whatever, you know, these, 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 basically a lot of open AI stuff, all of their demos, in my mind, I think the most interesting stuff really is the advances they've made in infrastructure, right, in, in oh, yeah. improving the speed at which things can be trained, uh, really just core infrastructural advancements. It's not so much modeling or really anything core algorithmic. It's totally much agree. How do you do this faster, better, so it doesn't take 300 years for me to train this model, right? What they've done with Kubernetes is fascinating. They've actually made Kubernetes, I mean, if you think about the workload managers and high-performance computing, the Slurms, the PBS, the Torx, the things that have been there for ages, they basically took Kubernetes and made it into like more Slurm-like. You know, if you go read their scaling to 7,500 nodes or whatever it is that, um, you know, they had a, I think, honestly, I think it's a CS500 host in Azure. I don't really remember. Um, but, you know, it's a massive computer that they have tons of teams working on at the same time and orchestrating all of that through Kubernetes. I mean, that is a feat. It is really, really hard to do that. Anybody who's ever worked on Kubernetes knows it's not really the best scheduler in the world. <laughs> it's, it's actually not very good at that. And Slurm still kind of holds the, the crown there is, you know, Facebook research for, you know, large distributed models training. You can see in their logs, they're still using Slurm. You know, they're hitting S info every three minutes. You know, that it is still, Slurm is still dominating that space. But what OpenAI, you're absolutely right. The infrastructure that they've deployed and what they've really focused on, it is fascinating what they've been able to do. Huh? How do you feel about some of the tools out there right now? I mean, besides what you were just mentioning, but I know there's some people that are like, I, I think about OctoML and then yeah. I also know about like uh, the folks that run, run AI, run that AI. Doing, yeah. yeah, they're doing stuff like that. Like it feels like there is a movement towards trying to uh, help this. I know they're not at, like OctoML and run AI aren't exactly competitors, but have you like geeked out on those at all? And do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is somewhere I've spent so, 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 so much time. And so nice. Um, I love hearing I was that. At, <laughs> yeah, so Determined, I don't know if you're familiar with Determined AI. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. They were, they're pretty much all Kubernetes, pretty much all Docker based. Um, and I was leading the team to basically get them on high performance computing workload managers. Um, that was what I was doing right before I left HP. Um, and so knowing Slurm and knowing things like Kubernetes and the differences became my job for a long time. Um, and so what I'll tell you is if, if you've ever used Kubernetes, you know, there's great APIs for almost everything. You can just spin up a proxy and, you know, ping it to do this or change this configuration and deploy that Helm chart to do X. Slurm does not do that. I mean, it has a plugin system, but have fun writing to the C API so that you plug it in and have fun having that not mess up whatever plugin the sysadmin of that site's already done to make it, you know, some different, you, you get the point, right? There is not the same capability. And yes, Slurm does have a REST API for those of you that are going to come back to me, but you can't launch jobs through that. And it doesn't have, and it's very young too. Um, this is not to say I don't love Slurm because I absolutely do. But the point there being there's discrepancies between the two that I think companies like Run.ai are probably trying to address right now. Because if you can take the scheduling ability of Slurm, mix it with the deployment options and flexibility and APIs of Kubernetes, you have an absolutely fantastic product. Yes. So you also wrote a paper that I want to dive into. I think (laughs) it's really cool. maybe a bit of background information on the paper and funny enough you were using redis for this paper yeah. right and it was before you were working at redis but this may might be where the love of redis came from it absolutely is yeah so um it's funny you mentioned that so um yeah the paper was actually um it was in collaboration with the national center of atmospheric research and 
and uh, University of Victoria um, with some great collaborators like Andrew Shao, Scott Bachman, Gustavo Marquez, um, and all the great folks at HPE. Um, it's, uh, it's a paper where we tried to use Redis as a online feature store to be able to stream numerical quantities out of a climate model, uh, running at, you know, full global scale. Like, so, you know, massive running on, you know, thousands and thousands of cores, CPU only though, not just ported to GPU. Um, and what we did was we streamed these numerical features over to Redis and then used Redis AI to run a PyTorch model on those numerical features to predict a quantity called eddy kinetic energy. Um, when we predicted that, we then streamed that back into the numerical model. It's a distributed Fortran code. Um, and we were able to improve the resolution, uh, the, you know, this resolved quantity of the model because of you know, how we were able to predict eddy kinetic energy from training on a high resolution version of the same climate model. Essentially, it, if you, you know, didn't catch that, the TLDR is we improved the climate model in terms of its skill. That's something climate models like to say because they avoid the term accuracy um, in terms of its skill um, because of this injection of this value of eddy kinetic energy that is not typically present in a low resolution version of this climate model. Um, and it's really, it's really fascinating to look at the difference between the analytical parameterizations and the machine learning parameterizations that went into this model. Um, and what enabled it was really the fact that we could spread a Redis instance over 128 nodes and take up the, you know, eight terabytes of memory and stream 100 gigabytes of time step to Redis because you can really just crush it with throughput if you have the systems to do so. Um, and that was a realization I made uh, a while ago when I was creating a framework called SmartSim, which is actually what we use in the paper to be able to do this. Um, so, yeah, I've been deep in the HPC land for quite a bit. Um, and that was that was kind of uh, dovetailing off some of my research that I also did uh, in undergrad as well. That sounds intense. It that, is that, intense. That description yeah. <laughs> was super intense. <laughs> it's hard to yeah. dumb down. It's, it's, it's hard to like, you know, bring it to it. There's a lot of research that went into it. So it's, it is hard to bring down a notch. But, but yeah, just, just the, I, the, the part that got me was just when you mentioned being able to scale across like eight terabytes of, of, of memory, right? You mentioned like basically <laughs> yeah. memory sort of comp. Wow. That's, that's insane. Yeah. It kind of sounds yeah, expensive. So, oh, yeah, who's paying for this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> HP mostly, um, at yeah. the time. Um, but yeah, we were, I was really, really blessed to have access to just XE fifties, X, you know, XE systems, the, the best supercomputers in the world for the early part of, you know, the first six years of my career. Um, I spent a, a lot of after work hours just playing with Horovod on, on, you know, CS 500s and XC fifties. And that was a huge blessing for me because it was just something I was geeking out over and I got to learn a lot. So, so as as a as an HPC guru, what are you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you or, or, okay, you as as a very as someone who likes diving into this stuff, what are you sure. most excited about? What, like, what applications or future applications of the tech do you get really excited about? And something that maybe we won't, we haven't seen yet, or we expect to see in the future, uh, or you know, if we if we line up the pieces correctly, we're going to see this later. And you can't wait for that future to happen. Well, I can't unveil everything, but if you uh, if you kind of put some pieces together, so I come from HPC land where I used Redis, um, and you know we are doing a lot of AI and ML at Redis, and I think you can kind of put two and two together that there may be some things that we do in the future that might be similar to the things that we were prototyping um, and you know, showing uh, at scale, maybe on you know, a smaller scale per se, maybe not the CS500 or the XC50 scale, but, you know, still distributed in large scale AI and ML with Redis. Um, so I think that's, that's one area that I'm really excited about is being able to do um, some more interesting things with Redis at that kind of scale in the future on different types of hardware too. That wasn't a good, a good teaser that <laughs> people aren't listening to and, and getting ready to sign up for it, then I don't know. I don't I can't think of a better way to pitch a product uh, than, than that. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. Well, I want to finish it up with like a little lightning round. And these lightning sure. rounds usually go uh, 
They're lightning, not so lightning, we could say. So try and answer these as short as you can. What was the last book you read? Oh, um, blank, Malcolm Gladwell. Just finished. Oh, nice. All right. Tell us about the last bug you smashed. The last bug I smashed. Um, I was on the pier <laughs> in... Uh, in um, God, where was that? Santa Cruz. I was in my car. I was on my hotspot. <laughs> and I uh, was basically working on our Python backend for this vector search app. And what happened was I uh, essentially created the embeddings wrong. I was using the wrong field name and nothing was coming back. And I was incredibly frustrated, mostly because my internet connection was terrible. But after I fixed it from IMG vector to image vector, it worked perfectly. And that was all my fault. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> there you go. Top learning from that. Make sure you get the names right. <laughs> Naming is hard. And uh, yeah, <laughs> don't and avoid using your hotspots when possible. And, uh, yes. There's also and there's the, the Don. Remember the Don Knuth quote that the two hardest problems in, in computer science are naming and cache and validation, both of which I think are relevant to you, right? <laughs> wow, that's really good. I should get that on, on a board in my office or something. Tattooed <laughs> on your arm, man. That's what you. Wow, that's dedication. That's dedication. Every go. single member of the Redis team. Every member of the Redis <laughs> yeah. team. That's your, that's your indoctrination. Your requirement to you join. join. Yeah. Requirement. That's it. Next offsite. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'll see if awesome. I can get some more on board for that. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so good. All right. So, what piece of technology are you bullish on that might surprise people? I think I will say feature platforms in general. Um, and that, that, you know, I think that might surprise some people because I think some people see them as like, you know, working on a small margin maybe, or, you know, maybe not filling as big a role as they should, but I, I think they're really important. And the, the larger abstractions that make things easier for people, kind of like what I was talking about with the hugging face model and model dot and code, um, and making things like creating embeddings easier. Feature platforms make a lot of these distributed systems that we used to have to think for about for days, you know, much simpler. And especially when you're deploying multiple databases for multiple purposes, I think um, those feature platforms can really help. Excellent. Last one, Sam. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, how is this a lightning question? <laughs> <laughs> we need three to five words for this one. No more than that, please. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as a nerd, I guess. You know, I uh, I think that's it. I, I as a person who really loves technology and wants to learn more every day about it. Like, and at the end of the day, that's who I am. Excellent, dude. Well, we're going to end there. Thank you so much. If anyone wants to check Thank out you. Redis... Or hit Sam up. You're in the community Slack. You're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And it's Redis. You know where to find Redis. I mean, let's be honest. If you don't, <laughs> it's R E D I S <laughs> Redis. Exactly. And you uh, made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Well, hey, thank y'all. It's been awesome.